Um, hi, everybody. Chris Broder from BICO, uh, Caitlin Martin from BICO, Lori Fishbard, uh, who is going to help us learn how to um, treat our bodies in the manner that they really uh, should be treated. We thank you guys for joining us so much. Uh, if your colleagues and friends would like to see this, the video of today's webinar will be up on BicoNet.com forward slash flourish, and then just click on the green room and, um, and all the videos from our past webinars are there as well. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Lori and um, I'm getting my pen and paper because I'm, I'm ready to hear what she's got to say. So Lori, take it away. Excellent, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if I can do this, right? All right, can everybody see this? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so as Chris said, my name is Lori Fishbard. I have been working with people improving their health through food and lifestyle changes for the past 10 years. I am a clinical nutritionist and an integrative health coach by training. And today I just wanna have a conversation with you guys about our health during this era of COVID. And my intention during our time together is really to help you feel more informed and empowered about how to focus on your mental and your physical health. So your immunity is your defense. Our immune systems are designed to be our warriors, our soldiers against invaders. And the best way to support our soldiers is to become educated in how our immune system works and how we can boost it. Because there's two parts to getting an infection, right? One is the microbe, the virus, and the other is the host. So we can't control the virus, but we can control the host, which is us, the terrain in which the virus lands. So if it lands in, in the hospitable terrain, then that's a good thing, right? It can't really set up its shop and do its thing. But if it lands in a more vulnerable environment, that's where things get dicey. So let's talk about how to optimize our health and booster our own defenses and immunity. I'm gonna go over my top 10 tips on how to boost the immune system. And if you have questions during my presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will get to them um, either as we go or at the end. All right, so my first tip is to eat the rainbow, right? How many times have you heard this? But each color of the rainbow represents a different family of healing compounds and all of the colors have powerful antioxidant benefits to our immune systems and to our whole bodies. They have phytonutrients that flood the body with all the vitamins and minerals that we need to stay healthy. So while all veggies are important, cruciferous veggies are really the gold standard when it comes to immune boosting. So include at least one cup daily. I'm talking about broccoli, kale, collards, bok choy, arugula, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, watercress, right? When's the last time I used watercress? Just got some and it's great in pesto and in smoothies. Try to put as many different colors in your shopping cart, whether that's at the store or online. And don't forget your white colors too, because white foods have a wide range of beneficial nutrients that boost the immune system because they're antiviral, they're antifungal, and they're anti-inflammatory, which helps to fight many infections. Aim for eight to 10 servings a day. Each serving is just a half a cup, so it may seem like a lot, but it's really not when you think about eight to 10 servings. You can get that probably if you eat a salad for lunch. All right, support your microbiome. So if you follow any type of you know, nutrition, um, science around nutrition, you'll know that the microbiome is the newest and the hottest thing. What our microbiome is, 
is it's located in our gastrointestinal tract and it's made up of trillions of different types of bacteria. And these guys are super important. These bacteria rule the school when it comes to your health. They bring nutrients to our cells, they run our metabolism, they make vitamins, and here's the kicker, 80% of our immune system lives in the gut. Okay, so these microbes help us fight disease, infectious disease, and they provide a front line in our immune defense. So if our gut is, you know, impaired or subpar, then our immune health is also going to be impacted as well. So what can we do to supercharge our gut microbiome? And the answer lies very much in the foods that we eat. So think fiber. Fiber feeds good bacteria. So think of high fiber foods as good for the gut. Lots of high fiber, colorful fruits and vegetables create a diverse microbiome. And we want a diverse, um, different types of bacteria living in our gut. We also want to have specifically prebiotic and probiotic rich foods in our diet. And you may have heard these terms, um, and you may or may not be familiar with them. Prebiotic foods are the fuel that feeds the good bacteria. So example of prebiotic rich foods include flax seeds, chia seeds, beans and legumes, um, oats, veggies like asparagus, artichokes, garlic, onions, and jicama root. Those are all your prebiotics. Probiotic rich foods are actually bacteria. They, they are actually good bacteria and they help to increase other good bacteria. So this is your yogurt, your kimchi, sauerkraut, pickles, kefir, um, and kombucha. So there's tons of studies out there that are being done with probiotics now and probiotic supplements. And they're, shown, they're showing very promising results on reducing the incidence of respiratory and gastrointestinal inf infections. Lori, we have a quick question uh, about the uh, white foods that we want to add to our grocery carts. Uh, what are some suggestions uh, that you have? Sure. So mushrooms, even though they're kind of brown, we classify them as white. Cauliflower, um, jicama root, um, garlic, onions, all of the prebiotic, prebiotic rich and white immune boosting. Those would all be examples of white foods. Perfect, thank you. Awesome. Okay, number three, prioritize sleep. So many of us have a unique opportunity to refine our habits while we're still in quasi lockdown, right? And we all know that sleep restores and heals the body. Without adequate sleep, optimal immune function is next to impossible. I'm gonna say that one more time. Without adequate sleep, optional immune function is next to impossible. So if this is an issue for you, I um, hope that I can inspire you to get in a better rhythm and get to bed earlier. So many of us are still working from home and I tell a lot of my clients, use the time that you would be commuting to and from work and use it towards your sleep totals because that's like found time. Another thing is I advise my clients to set an alarm, right? We set an alarm to wake up. So let's set an alarm to go to bed. My parents are, you know, binge watching everything that they can get their hands on. And I'm like, what time did you go to sleep last night? It's at two in the morning. You know, they're totally like, over 70 in that demographic that we really need to be really boosting the immune system right now. And there's no need to watch Ozark till two in the morning. It's going to be there the next day. I fight with them all the time about this. So I had them start setting an alarm because I get it. I know it's super easy to just watch your thing. And before you know it, it's, it's late. So setting that alarm, you know, 10.30, 11 o'clock, 11.30, whatever works for you. If you normally go to sleep at one, don't, go, don't try to go to sleep at 11 tonight. You need to move it up kind of incrementally because we get into a circadian rhythm. But aim for, you know, eight, seven to eight hours a night. It, it differs for everyone. I'm actually a nine hour a night girl myself. I need a lot of sleep. 
but you'll know, like you'll figure out kind of how much sleep do you need? Do you wake up rested? Do you have sustained energy throughout the day? You'll get a handle on kind of what sleep and the sleep totals that work for you. All right, so who knows about their lymphatic system? So we don't really talk about our lymphatic system a lot, um, but I wanted this to be part of my list because your lymphatic system works directly with your cardiovascular system to keep blood and lymphatic fluids levels in balance and to flush toxins out of the body. And it carries immune cells throughout the body to help defend against infections. So it's important to support this system by activating it. Many of us activate our lymphatic systems and we don't even know it, but there are certain mindful ways that you can activate the lymphatic system. I listed a few here, massage, dry brushing. Um, you can see a dry brush in the picture. You kind of just do it in circular motions, um, actually towards your heart on your skin. It feels really great before a shower. Foam rolling. Um, or bouncing on a rebounder. I recently had a client tell me, oh, I think I have one of those, like a rebounder in my attic. And she brought it down and now she's using it on a daily basis and it's really affecting her health in a positive way. So it's important to do this. There are also certain foods that help promote lymph flow. Um, I listed lemon and ginger here. And these do double duty because they also are great for the gut. So try drinking lemon water in the morning, it's a nice way to start the day, maybe some ginger tea in the afternoon, um, but lots of different ways here to stimulate the lymphatic system. Laura, you've got a question about the rebounder. Can you explain what that is? So think of it as a mini trampoline that really is like a trampoline for one, and you just kind of bounce on it. You can slowly do like a little jog on it. You can do a bouncing. They actually recommend it a lot for your 55 and older plus, your 55 plus group um, as a great way to stimulate the lymphatic system. But it's just, you can get as active on it or not as possible. They also use it a lot with physical therapy. You can get them online, Amazon. Any other questions? That's it for now, thank you. Okay, so this is a big one, um, stress, right? Prioritize stress management. So I know stress is probably um, high or higher for many of us um, right now. Um, and a lot of us are used to incorporating stress management into their lives um, and others are not, right? So if you have something that is working for you and that has worked for you pre-COVID, during COVID, Keep doing it. I encourage you to keep doing it. Um, if you don't have something, I hope that maybe one of these ideas will inspire you to start doing something because obviously we know when we're stressed, right? It's a feeling, we, we, we get a sense of stress, but a lot of times we don't know when the body is stressed. It could be because of uh, diet or lifestyle or environmental reasons. And so the body is experiencing stress, but we may not feel it. So it's really important important to manage stress on a daily basis to keep the body in kind of that out of that fight or flight. You've probably heard that out of that kind of aroused stage. And something that you may already know intuitively is that stress impacts the immune system negatively, right? We, there's a study and we've seen that increased levels of stress increase susceptibility specifically to viral infections. There was one study where volunteers had cold viruses put up their noses, they agreed to do this, uh, but, and then they were, they were told to, they had to fill out a stress questionnaire. The ones that scored higher on the stress questionnaire were the ones that contracted the virus. And the numbers were crazy, it was like in the 90%. Um, we also know that stress affects the microbiome by locking up digestion. It can cause a decrease in blood and oxygen flow to the stomach. It can cause an imbalance in gut bacteria, we were just talking about, and it can lead to inflammation. So by integrating stress reduction methods in your life, you're supporting your gut health as well. Lots of ways that I mentioned here that you can manage and lower your stress, 
um, meditation, yoga, uh, mindful, just mindfulness, deep breathing, hot baths, um, dancing in your living room, um, starting that garden that you th thought about, or even planting herbs, you know, and get outside. It's hot out there, but the fresh air is good for us, the vitamin D that we're gonna be talking about. So take walks, get outside. I've realized that our culture actually fears rest because it feels like we're not being productive or we're gonna get behind. Um, and other cultures really aren't this way. And I, this is something that I personally struggle with, so I, I really get it. But resting is one of the most productive things that we could do for our body and our mind. Tons of resources online still uh, right now for stress management. I think we've seen a real surge in that because of COVID. So that's a positive thing that we've seen. Um, my two teenage daughters have been doing the jabs class and they love it and it gets them up out of bed and doing it. It's a great stress reliever, great exercise for their body and mind. Um, I've been taking breathing breaks during the day. So whatever really works for you, find something and, and try it and see how it feels. One thing I also really like is to practice gratitude. Gratitude is one of the strongest emotions that influence our physiology. And so it can literally pull you out of an anxious space. And you can show gratitude any way that you, can, that you want. You can journal about it. You can tell the people that you live with what you're grateful for. You could also try a mantra, you know, that may sound a little woo-woo, but it totally works. You know, you can say, I am happy and I'm grateful to be healthy. I am grateful to have a body I can take care of. You know, I'm grateful to have a family who I love and who loves me, like most of the time, right? If you've been living with your family since March, like I have. Um, but I don't want to, you know, minimize the situation because we're living in a global pandemic. This is real. This is, for some of us, very close to home. And by doing some of the stress management, it can really help to refuel our tank that might be very close to empty. And the more you fill that tank, the more empowered you'll feel to be of service to yourself and to others. Um, lastly, I just want to mention that I think it's super important to stay connected with friends and family right now. Um, even if it's not, you know, even if you're social distancing, it's over Zoom, whatever it is, being in close contact with those who you love is really essential for your mental and your emotional health. We had a question going back to uh, getting enough lemon. Um, do you have a preference or is there any research uh, one way or another about having hot lemon water or cold lemon water? So the body likes homeostasis. What does that mean? The body likes to keep things kind of where the body's at. So where's the body? Like for most of us, it's about 98.6, right? So when you drink something, your body has to adapt and either warm up or cool off. So from a physiological point, I would say the body likes room temperature, maybe a little on the warm side, um, lemon water. So maybe half, you know, hot with a, some splash of cold. That the body doesn't have to work too hard to assimilate and metabolize it. But if you like cold water and cold water serves you in a, in, a, in a good way, drink cold water, right? It's really kind of up to you and the way you're gonna drink it. Does that answer that question? I think so, thank okay. you. Good, good, good. All right, so let's dive into how to stimulate and boost the immune system through food and supplements. Um, I just want to say before we get into this that there's a lot of information and misinformation out there about what supplements may hurt or help us um, or chances of fighting off or recovering from COVID. And honestly, we, we don't know, right? We don't know yet. We're, we're still learning so much about this virus. But what we do know is that there is a lot of good science which underscores the importance of certain nutrients that are crucial in immune function. And if you're looking at a list, vitamin C is going to top it every single time. Vitamin C is super important for the immune system. It really is kind of the central vitamin that we think of. 
So foods that are high in vitamin C, think citrus, think greens, think bell peppers. A red bell pepper actually has more vitamin C than an orange. Uh, kiwi, really high in vitamin C, who knew, right? And strawberries. So as a nutritionist, I like for my clients to aim for 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. That is very hard to get through food. If you start really looking up how many milligrams are in like, you know, a cup of strawberries, it's hard to get to. So I don't think, I think supplementation is not a bad idea here. Um, again, always work with a professional um, when you are talking about supplementation so that you know what you're doing. Um, vitamin C becomes depleted when we're stressed. So here's the stress again. Um, the more stressed we are, the more vitamin C we need. And we use vitamin C like that. This presentation, we're all probably using 1,000 milligrams of our vitamin C. So we're constantly needing vitamin C. Um, and most people aren't getting enough, um, even through supplementation. So I would say aim for the foods that have a lot of vitamin C, look into supplementation. If you do get sick with anything, that's always a good time to boost your vitamin C, either through food or supplementation. Um, many of you might know there's been some really promising studies on intravenous vitamin C that um, as a treatment for COVID with some great results. I know a few hospitals in the, around the world are, are, are looking into this and testing this out. So I'm keeping my eye on that. But I think vitamin C is a really powerful antiviral and uh, booster for the immune system. We, uh, we would like to know, is there a different, um, I guess, amount of milligrams per day based on your weight or um, is, it, is it pretty much ballpark of one to 2,000. So the way that they do RDAs, which is the uh, required dietary intake, um, adequate intake, is men and women, and then they have children and they have pregnant women. So it's, I'm not actually sure what the RDA is, because in my personal opinion, I believe the RDAs are low, especially when we're talking about boosting the immune system, but it's differentiated by gender. I would add it's differentiated by bioindividuality. How is your digestion? How is your absorption? Are you able to absorb the nutrients from the, all those sources of vitamin C you may be eating? So I really think it's very different. I'm putting aim for that down in case people wanna look into supplementation. That's kind of a good place to start. Lori. Yeah. Oh, I just forgot my question. Isn't that terrible? I know what my question was. Okay. Overdose on vitamin C? So what's interesting is the body will let you know if you can overdose. There's nothing that I have seen in the literature that shows that there are toxic overdoses of it. Um, your digestion will start to talk to you if you have too much vitamin C. So I have a colleague who actually was um, very sick. It wasn't COVID, but he was very sick. And he was taking upwards of, of about eight to 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C, and he got horrible diarrhea. And that is his body saying, we're done here. You need to back it up. We're just like, it's just flushing through. So a lot of people will actually do a test and they'll kind of see how far they can go. I am not encouraging this to do without supervision of someone you're working with, a, a doctor or a clinician. Um, but that is kind of the way that the body will tell you if it's too much vitamin C. Gotcha. Yeah, but vitamin C is one of those safe ones that you can't really do too much harm by experimenting with it a little bit. Okay. So different um, ways that you can boost the vitamin C absorption. Can you marry vitamin C with another type of food or vitamin to help uh, promote absorption in your body? So vitamin C is one of those um, vitamins that actually doesn't need a kind of a cofactor, a partner to absorb it. But when I say absorption may be compromised, you know, so many of us are walking around with digestion issues of some sort, maybe low stomach acid, maybe a little IBS, whatever it is, all of that affects absorption. Stress affects absorption. We could do a whole seminar on absorption, really. I mean, it's, it's you know, they used to say you are what you eat, and now we say you are what you absorb because we're not absorbing all these great things. So... I would say 
to work on absorbing vitamin C would just be to work on your gut microbiome and maximize your gut health so that you're able to absorb. All right, so let's talk about zinc because like vitamin C, zinc is known to play a central role in the immune system. It's crucial for normal development and function of cells, mediating nonspecific immunity. It acts like an antioxidant, which protects the body from oxidative stress and free radical damage. It too can be rapidly depleted when the body is stressed or fighting an illness. And we actually see zinc deficiencies often, again, in that 55 and older group. Um, so one way that you can, I don't know if you've heard of this, um, but some people who have experienced COVID, we've heard that they've kind of experienced uh, altered or loss of taste or smell. You guys heard this? That is also a symptom that we see a lot of zinc deficiency. So now there are theories being researched about those who experience this symptom have an underlying zinc deficiency, which I find is fascinating, right? Because we might not know. Zinc is not one of those things that's tested. You can ask your practitioner, your medical provider to test for zinc. They may or may not. Um, but there's actually a pretty simple and efficient way or a tool to test your zinc. Um, it's not 100%. It's just kind of could give you some, some information. It's called the zinc tally. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but it's zinc sulfate. And you basically, it's liquid. You swish it in your mouth for about 30 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds. And then depending on what you experience, what taste you experience, tells us if you may or may not need to increase some of your foods with zinc or supplementation. So if it tastes like nothing, if it tastes like water, or it just has like a pleasant, sweet taste, then that tells us you probably have, it's, it's worth looking into that you may have a zinc deficiency. If it tastes very strong and if it's a metallic taste, then you're not zinc deficient most likely. Again, not a 100% diagnostic thing. It's just one of those things that will give us a clue, one of the things, one of the tools in the toolbox that we can use. So foods that are high in zinc, if we have any shellfish lovers out there, oysters, crabs, lobster, super high in zinc, um, red meat, legumes, beans, uh, seeds, specifically pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds are super high in zinc. Um, yeah, those are the foods that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, for zinc, you know, we want to aim for about 10 milligrams a day. Um, and obviously, if we're sick, we want to kind of have a little bit more. Um, but zinc is an important one. And if anyone is interested in trying this zinc tally, I'm happy to provide information about this. Lori, would a general multivitamin help uh, provide these recommended levels of zinc, vitamin C, and those types of things? Or is this something you need to supplement above and beyond your typical vitamin? So it really depends. It's a good question. There's so many multivitamins out there. I have no idea. Do I even have a multivitamin on my shelf here? It's so all over the place. I think probably a multivitamin might have five to 10 milligrams of zinc, maybe 200 milligrams of vitamin C. So for preventative health, I think a multivitamin might be fine. Again, I would ask you, you know, how good is your absorption? How healthy is your gut? Those are always factors. I think if we're trying to boost, um, I think if our lives are a little bit more stressed and we may be depleting it that way, or there's like global pandemic going on and we just want that kind of extra barrier, we want to be a warrior in our own defense, I think taking higher levels is probably a good idea. Again, under the supervision of somebody that you're working with that knows what they're doing. I think that's important. All right, so let's continue with some more immune support. Um, so through peer-reviewed literature, we've learned how certain nutrients have shown to suppress viral loads, as well as boost and stimulate the immune system. Again, I'm not making any claims that any of these vitamins that I'm discussing are proven to cure or reverse COVID-19. We don't have that information. But what I am sharing is that there's, a so, there's an association 
between good quality levels of these vitamins and minerals in the human body and viral suppression. Some of the studies, um, and I have cited them, I'm happy to share them with you, were conducted with other viruses, um, such as the rhinovirus or influenza. But because coronavirus is part of the viral family, you know, we can take a leap of faith that the immune system has something to do with keeping this at bay. So I wanted to give you guys um, a list of, of things, other nutrition and supplements that could boost the immune system. We already talked about colorful foods. I put it on here again because I think it's worth repeating. I recently read that eight out of 10 people don't eat enough colors and therefore they're not getting all those phytonutrients like quercetin and lycopene and resveratrol that are so important to maintaining good health and boosting the immune system. So just remember, the more vibrant the color, the more phytonutrients that are gonna flood the body and support your immune health. So if you're not eating your colors, please start eating your colors. Aim for five colors a day. Medicinal mushrooms, such as shiitake or mataki, have been around for thousands of years. And it's not uncommon now to see them in a lot of like powders and capsules as supplements. But honestly, just eating mushrooms is a great idea. So what's the association between, like what's the viral association when it comes to mushrooms? Again, in numerous studies, both medicinal and culinary mushrooms have been found to have antiviral compounds. Mushrooms also contain polysaccharides called beta-glucons, which boost and modulate the immune system. So if you love mushrooms and you haven't been eating them, throw them in your cart this week. Garlic is a big one. Garlic is naturally antiviral, and you've, you may have heard this before, and it's a broad spectrum antimicrobial agent. So there's a reason why people used to wear garlic around their necks and ate a tremendous amount of garlic during the polio um, virus breakout. It's most potent when it's eaten raw. Um, the way I use raw garlic is I will throw it in salad dressings. I will put it in pesto. I'll just put some raw garlic on top of some cooked veggies. You know, look, thankfully we're all social distancing and we're wearing masks, so we don't have to worry about our garlic breath. So just go to town. That's probably the only opportunity we'll have to eat as much garlic as we want with no consequences. Um, but garlic is a, is a good one. That's one of those white foods that we talked about earlier. I included protein because the immune system actually depends on protein, uh, those amino acids, to build and repair muscle tissues and cells, including white blood cells. And obviously our white blood cells are important when we're talking about viruses and the immune system because they are our primary defense against infection. And the body is constantly regenerating new white blood cells, but uh, in order to do this, it needs protein. And I would just say, you know, ideally we want to eat the highest quality of protein that we can afford whether for you that's plant-based or animal protein, whatever is working for you, it's boosting the immune system. All right, let's talk about some supplements. Um, before I, I just wanna say this one more time, this is totally informational. You should talk to your doctor or your nutritionist before you start any kind of herbal or supplement remedy because you may be taking medications or supplements that can interact with these, um, or they can be contraindicated if you have a certain health condition. So please always check with your doctor. I'm giving this to you so that you'll have the questions to ask and you'll feel empowered with the information. So my first one is glutathione. This is a critical antioxidant that's in the body. And I call it our superpower because um, it's involved with so many things and it does so many good things for the body. Our body makes it naturally, um, but it can be low uh, because of various reasons. And from previously published studies, we know that glutathione has antiviral activity um, with both DNA and RNA viruses. We know that coronavirus is an RNA virus, so we can make some association there. Some foods that naturally contain glutathione include carrots, broccoli, avocado, spinach, apples, and asparagus. So you can also take glutathione as a supplement, 
The best way to do that is in a liposomal form, uh, but you can get it from foods as well. Vitamin D, this is the big one too. So vitamin D is clearly established in the literature that it plays a major role in regulating the immune system, including immune response to viral infection. So both interventional and observational epidemiological studies provide evidence that a vitamin D deficiency actually increases your risk to viral infections like influenza and a respiratory tract infection. So vitamin D is an important uh, vitamin for white blood cells to do their job as well. And the reality is, is that most of us have insufficient levels of vitamin D. It is synthesized through the sun, but they say it's, it's hard to get enough if we live north of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and it's also not in a lot of foods. I think it's in egg yolks, it is in mushrooms, uh, liver. Um, but you know, the amounts of vitamin D that are in these foods are not likely to move the needle enough to make an impact on your vitamin D levels. So vitamin D is one of those things where supplementation is usually needed. Um, it's good to get it checked. That is something that most doctors these days will run for you is your vitamin D levels. See where you are, and then you can make an informed decision with your practitioner about where you need to be and if you should take supplementation. I wanted to go over a few um, herbs for some herbal support. Astragalus is uh, an apt it has aptogenic qualities meaning that it helps our bodies adapt to stress. So it works a little bit different for all of us. Um, and it stimulates the immune system in a positive way. Um, elderberry is very rich in vitamin C, very supportive for the immune system. You may see this sold as lozenges or syrup. I actually have my bag right here. This is elderberry with zinc. Um, I just keep them right here and pop them just because they're good and I feel good about doing it. But the mechanism of action of elderberry extract is that it binds to the tiny spikes on a, vi on a virus protein that are used to invade healthy cells and it destroys them so that the virus is ineffective. So elderberry is a good one to have around. Ginger, we spoke about ginger earlier as stimulating the lymphatic system. It's also very anti-inflammatory and high in antioxidants and good for supporting digestion. So as we've learned now that good digestion supports good immune system. So ginger is a good one to have. I just get a big root. I keep it in my freezer. I put it in smoothies. I put it in stir fries. I'm using it all the time. Um, thyme. So thyme is a, we probably all use that thyme as an herb. Um, it's typically used medicinally for issues of the lungs, so respiratory issues. Um, because coronavirus has been classified as a respiratory illness, it is a good thing to kind of have on hand to maybe use more frequently. You can have thyme tea. Um, if you have it, if you're into essential oils, you can get thyme as an essential oil and maybe diffuse it. It smells amazing and you're boosting your immune system. Um, but it's a good thing to have around. If you wanted to plant that herb garden, maybe include thyme. And then finally, my favorite, which is turmeric. So turmeric I use all the time. It has an active compound in it called curcumin. Curcumin is highly anti-inflammatory and has powerful antioxidant effects. So curcumin is best absorbed when we take it with a fat source. Um, so here's one of those things where we do want to make sure we take it with something else for maximum and proper absorption. So it's best taken with a fat source and black pepper. So some ways to use it. Throw it in a smoothie. Um, put two tablespoons in a soup that you're making. If you're doing a curry, it's usually included double the amount. Um, if you make rice or quinoa or other grains, you can put it in the water or put it in your grain after you've already cooked it. It adds a pop of color and it also adds a pop of immune boosting. So curcumin is a great one to have on hand. It comes in the powder. You can also get turmeric root, which I have started getting. And I'll put, I'll, um, you just kind of do it the same way you do ginger, right? You take off the skin, cut it up, make a tea, 
throw it in a smoothie, put it in soups, whatever. Very easy to use. Laura, we have quite a few questions if you're prepared. Uh, it looks sure. like you're engaging everybody uh, very well, so thank you for that. Um, we have a question, is there a difference in benefit between cooked or raw vegetables? So there are, is, is the question, is there a difference? Yes. So there is a difference in that yes. raw vegetables have certain enzymes that when you cook them, we lose the enzymes. There's also vegetables that when we cook them, we create enzymatic function. We create enzymes. So I would say eat some raw, eat some cooked, and mix it up, right? If you always are eating your red cabbage raw, roast it. Have you guys ever had roasted red cabbage? It's delicious. Like I never, I just made that up one night and I was like, oh my God, we all loved it. This has now become a family favorite. So mix up what you're doing. If you're always a salad person, put those on a cookie sheet and roast those vegetables and eat those sometimes because there's benefits. And if you're really interested, you can actually Google and see, you know, what do you get when you eat a raw piece of broccoli versus a cooked piece of broccoli? In my opinion, there's benefits to both. Um, and the important thing is just to eat many colors and eat a diverse array of them because again, that's gonna feed that good bacteria in the gut. Thank you. Um, our next question, is there a recommended amount um, of, oh my goodness, I don't know how to pronounce it. Blue Glutathione. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Is that what it is? Glutathione? That. Yeah. So glutathione usually um, will say on the bottle, you know, I think it's 100 to 300 milligrams. This is one of those things that I would check with your practitioner um, about. I think, you know, I think most doctors are probably okay. The body will, can always use more glutathione. I would stay within the um, confounds of whatever the particular type of products that you got. And if you have any questions about that, asking them your, the person that you're working with. Um, and with anything, because we don't know how our bodies are going to react, and again, we always wanna check if we're taking medicines or other supplements because of the interactions, but we always wanna start slow and then build up, right? Because you just kinda of wanna see how it, it affects the body before you just bam the body with like a lot of something. Perfect. Um, next one is elderberry recommended as a preventative measure or should you just take it at the onset of a virus? So both. You can take it preventatively. It does have, um, you know, immune boosting effects, but it is really the most effective is, you know, that day that you're like feeling, oh, I'm feeling a little off. I think I might be coming down with something. If you're not taking it prophylactically, if you're not taking it, you know, just preventatively, then I, that's when I would start with the elderberry. Awesome. And the last one, I think, um, is there a test to understand your vitamin levels? There are vitamin tests out there. They're called micronutrient testing. And there's a few companies out there that do this. The one that I work with is called SpectraCell. It's a functional test. So many of your conventional or allopathic doctors may not be familiar with these tests or run these tests. The answer is they do exist. And if you're interested, um, I would find a practitioner, usually it's a functional or integrative practitioner who can help you run these tests. And usually, you know, a lot of times I will get a client and I'll just kind of look physically at them, do some, you know, specific looking around maybe at their nails. We know that white spots on the nails, for instance, may indicate a zinc deficiency. Just by talking to them, clinicians can actually learn a lot about potential nutrient deficiencies. So I think that's a good place to start is to start working with someone. And then if you really wanna know your levels and you wanna know more, that's when something like a micronutrient test might be helpful. Now, Usually when you do just a regular blood draw, um, they will do things like B12, sometimes even B9, um, vitamin D is becoming more prevalent. So it kind of depends who your practitioner is, but I would definitely recommend having a conversation about it if that's something that you're interested in knowing. Okay, so let you move on. Okay, great. All right, number nine, drink lots of water. Okay, duh, right? We all know this. 
but I feel like I wanted to, to say it because keeping well hydrated is more important than we may realize. And our brain is made up of 80% water and it's really very sensitive to dehydration. So proper hydration also supports our mucous membranes, right? And our eyes, um, our nasal passages, our mouth. And what are these? So these are some of our first lines of defense when it comes to you know, an illness or viral infection. So if those are dried out, your defense system is reduced and you are more likely to get sick. So it makes sense to stay hydrated. I think a lot of us drink, think we drink more water than we do. So if you're interested, it's a good idea just to count one day, just to see how many ounces your glass is and just to see how much water you're drinking. A good rule of thumb is to drink half of your body weight in ounces per day. So if you weigh 140 pounds, drinking 80, is that math right? 70 um, ounces of water a day is what you wanna aim for. And speaking of water, I'm gonna take a quick sip. But this is my Yeti, this is 20 ounces. I try to drink, I don't know, six of these a day, six to eight of these a day. All right, I might lose some people here. And I, I might, um, you might be mad, but I, I have to say this because it's, it's really important that the data is very clear on this, that sugar suppresses the immune system and it worsens, worsens viral infections. So if you want to feed the virus, eat sugar. And I get that this is really hard because when we are living in uncertain times, sometimes eating sugar is a comfort to us. I know that I'm definitely in that boat, um, but it's really the worst time to do this. And I'm gonna lose more people when I'm about to say this, but it's also a good idea to limit or stop drinking alcohol. Alcohol suppresses immune function and it depletes key nutrients. And one of the key nutrients that alcohol depletes is guess what? Glutathione, that superpower, that critical antioxidant in our bodies. So it can also increase vulnerability to lung infections. So again, it's a time to hit pause on our normal habits, you know, and replace them with better habits. Is this something that you may have an issue with? Do you eat more sugar than you want? Okay, so maybe it's time to double down. Load yourself up with sweet fruits and vegetables that you know can help with cravings. Um, I also put on here that if you eat protein at every meal, that helps with cravings and keeping you full as well. Um, but I, I get that I'm not gonna win any popularity contests with telling people not to drink or not to eat sugar. And maybe a step for you is to limit, maybe just to start scaling back a little bit. Whatever feels right for you, I would encourage you to try it um, and see how you feel. Right? I definitely am a sugar addict. I have been my whole life. I struggle with this all the time, but I'm constantly just trying to be mindful about the sugar I'm putting into my body is not serving me or my immune system well. And so I just try to be mindful in the amounts and how I navigate through that. So if anyone needs help around this, um, again, that, that would be a great time to, to you know, see a health coach or a nutritionist and kind of talk about this and have accountability and kind of work towards this goal. Lori, there's a question about natural sugar. So you mentioned about uh, filling the void with fruits and um, maybe other vegetables. Do we still need to limit ourselves with eating uh, fruits and things like that that are high in sugar content? No, because I am all about um, natural sugars, the, the natural fructose that is in fruits and vegetables, those are combined with fiber and phytonutrients and antioxidants. So they work like a whole package, delivering everything that your body needs. You know, if you came to see me and you had fatty liver disease and really elevated liver enzymes, then I think we would look at your fructose and say, we're gonna, we're gonna scale. If you were somebody that had a lot of fruit, we'd scale back for that reason. But for anyone just thinking, you know, sugar, you shouldn't equate 
fruits and vegetables that have a little bit of a higher glycemic index or a higher content of sugar, you shouldn't equate that with what I'm talking about, which is the refined stuff, the white stuff, the powdered stuff, even some of the naturals, you know, the maple syrup and the honey. It's all okay in moderation. We just don't want to overdo it. All right. Well, again, references, happy to provide these. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. So Lori, one thing I think that might be great um, to offer uh, everybody who's online and those that watch it later is um, I started to write them down. And of course, I've already bought my rebounder on Amazon. So thanks so much. Uh, maybe, or your, my bouncer, is some of the recommended items that you suggested that people purchase. Maybe we could almost make like an Amazon wish list. Um, myself, I wrote a zinc tester and then um, so some of these different supplements uh, as a potential. Um, are we able to do something like that? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm thinking dry brush. But yes, I can absolutely come up with a list of some of the supplements that I like. Um, again, I would just say make sure that you check with your um, provider before you start any type of supplementation. But I can, I've done a ton of research on so many different brands, and I'm happy to share that with this group so that they can make some good informed decisions along with their practitioner. Well, this has been fantastic. Caitlin, do we have any other last questions in our chat? We sure do. Um, uh, can you elaborate about, I guess, carbohydrates in your diet? What to do, what not to do? So carbohydrates are super important. We've got three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, fats. We need all three of them. There are different ways of eating where you might have different percentages of your macronutrients. But the bottom line is that they're all super important. And all of those fruits and vegetables we talked about, guess what? They're carbohydrates. So we need all of those. Do we need all of the refined and processed carbohydrates? No, that's where we get into trouble. And I think people kind of group carbohydrates as one thing. And when they think of, you know, oh, thank you. When they think of carbohydrates, they think all carbohydrates are bad. And I just don't think that's the case. I think that um, we need all of our fruits and vegetables, even our bananas and our mangoes, the ones that are, you know, might have more sugar in them. Um, so I am not a fan of, of limiting a macronutrient group. I understand that there's many dietary plans that do do that. And I think for specific reasons and for specific clients, though, can, those can be good interventions. Um, but I am not kind of a person that says, you know, everybody should go low carb. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, um, is apple cider vinegar good to add to your diet? Yes, apple cider vinegar is great. I once wrote a blog post, like my 100 favorite reasons about using apple cider vinegar, um, because it is, it could be good for, as a liver tonic for just detoxification. It can help with weight loss. It can be a, um, if you have low stomach acid, it can provide support for the stomach to be able to um, break down those amino acids, those proteins. It can be good for your hair. I have read it could be good for your scalp, balancing your pH. So I think apple cider vinegar with the mother, it has to say with the mother, that's the, that's the key on apple cider vinegar. It has to have the live probiotic in it. It is a probiotic, it has to be fermented, it has to say with the mother. So apple cider vinegar with the mother is, definitely should be in everybody's pantry. In do, you, do you just drink that on its own or do you put it in a shake or do you? So for my clients who one of their goals is to, to lose weight, um, and there may be some stomach acid issues there. I have a tonic that I do, and I can include this on the list too, but it's basically eight ounces of water, uh, a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, a tablespoon of lemon, and a tablespoon of cinnamon. And you just shake that thing up, and it's actually quite good. And there's some studies that have been shown that when you drink apple cider vinegar before eating a meal, it helps to assimilate, metabolize, and break down the food in a more efficient way. There's actually a lot of research, surprisingly, on apple cider vinegar. It used to just kind of be like, you know, old wives' tale. But there, there's some real evidence uh, now that is supporting some real um, promising uses for apple cider vinegar. 
system. And um, choosing a probiotic is challenging with so much information out there. Are there any staple ingredients that, uh, that we should look for? It's such a good question. And that is so true. And I find myself um, giving different probiotics to different clients for different reasons. And I, and, I, and I wish I could just say to all of you listening, go get this probiotic, it's the best. But the thing is, is there's different strains. You may need them, you may not. If you tell me you have yogurt every day, I'm gonna know that you have lactobacillus and you probably don't need a probiotic that's heavy on lactobacillus. And I might go more towards a score biotic for you. So that is one of those things where I, I advise you to work with somebody who knows a little bit about probiotics and can make somewhat of an educated uh, recommendation for you. Lori, do you find that you work best with someone when they're trying to make these changes that they also have, uh, um, you know, a, an integrated medicine doctor as well? Because is that the person running the test to assist you in assisting your clients with the right ways, you know, with, with their own body's uh, issues? It's certainly beneficial. The reality, Chris, is that there's not a lot out there. There's very few functional integrative doctors out there. I think I know two in the area that I live in. Um, so I, and, and I don't, they don't always take insurance. So it doesn't always make sense for a patient to be able to do that. I work very much in tandem with those, but I'm also um, so happy to partner with conventional doctors who are willing to um, understand the value of you know, food and lifestyle. And so many more are, right? So many doctors say to me, Lori, we didn't have a lick of nutrition in medical school, but I'm learning so much now. And this stuff about the microbiome is so fascinating. So I think we are kind of changing, but I don't think it's necessary to have a whole slew of, you know, functional and integrative team. I think if you have, if this is something that you interests you to kind of take more of a functional and integrative approach, I think having a practitioner or two you know, will fill your bucket with enough information to be able to then kind of navigate your health. Because this is what this is all about, right? Giving you information that you're able to navigate your health, work with your providers as partners, but it's your health and it's your decisions. Um, and it's really the way you live your life and what you put in your mouth. Those to me are the most important decisions that we can make. Got you. How are we doing on questions, Caitlin? And we have just uh, two more follow-up questions here. I do want to make mention, I had posted in the chat from Dr. Martin, who also did our meditation. Um, if you're looking for a functional medicine doctor, you can use the website ifm.org to find one. Um, our questions here, um, should a probiotic be included daily as part of your regimen? And should apple cider vinegar be taken hot or cold? So apple cider vinegar room temperature, just use it straight out of the um, bottle. We don't want to heat it because it will kill the, or it could kill the mother. We don't want to mess with the mother. Um, so just use it at room temperature. The probiotic question was, should we use it every day? Yes. Yes. So we should be eating or taking probiotics every day. Why? Because we want to feed those good guys in our gut. So whether it's supplement whether it's not, let's say one day you go crazy and you have a, you know, 100% organic hot dog with sauerkraut and then you drink a kombucha with that and you have just, you're like, well, I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling like I really fed my gut with some good bacteria. Maybe you don't take your probiotic that day. You know what I'm saying? Like, but on a normal day, if you're getting a little bit of probiotic rich foods, I think it makes sense also to supplement normally with a probiotic. And don't forget those prebiotic rich foods too. We're all about probiotics but we need to feed the fuel. We need to feed the probiotics what they need. So it's really important to get the prebiotics and those are very easily assimilated. So those, I would say go with foods rather than supplements for prebiotics. That's awesome. Well, how beautiful. We ended at 159. Uh, congratulations, Lori, on your timing because that was fantastic. Um, I've taken a ton of notes and I'm probably gonna have to go back and watch the video again. Uh, but we thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we are looking uh, forward to partnering with you on other opportunities to share with our customers. We thank everybody so much for being online today. Happy Thursday. 
Uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.